Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you all for tuning in. I want to start today uh, by reminding everyone about a special Vermont tradition happening tomorrow, Green Up Day, when we do our part to clean up the roadsides around the state. First Green Up Day was launched by Governor Dean Davis in 1970. They had over 77,000 volunteers that day picking up litter. In recent years, we've collected 450,000 pounds of debris and over 5,000 tires annually. So I encourage all Vermonters to get out there and help out if you can. Next, earlier this week, the CDC updated its guidance for masking outdoors. So today, I'll be signing an amendment to the emergency order updating Vermont's policy as well. Effective tomorrow, May 1st, masks will no longer be required when you're outdoors if physical distancing can be maintained. This includes both those who are vaccinated or not vaccinated as yet. Dr. Levine will go into further detail about why this is safe in a few moments, uh, but the science and data show that outdoor transmission is rare and poses little risk if you follow our guidance. As an example, if you're walking down the street, you don't need to wear a mask. If you're at the dog park and you're not in a crowd, you don't need a mask. If you're with people outdoors in accordance with the gathering policy, you don't need a mask. I do want to mention that municipalities and businesses do have the ability to have stricter policies if they so choose. And as more Vermonters are vaccinated, we'll take additional steps in the near future. Finally, earlier this week, we hit our May 1st vaccination target with 60% of Vermonters over the age of 16. So tomorrow, we move to step two of the Vermont Forward Plan, which brings most sectors in under what's called universal guidance. We outlined this at the beginning of the month. So as a reminder, this plan was developed in direct consultation with the Department of Health, including Dr. Levine and Dr. Kelso, the Agency of Human Services, as well as our emergency operations team and many others. As has been the case from the start, we're relying on the advice of our experts. Mr. Sherling will go into further detail to remind everyone what this means, but I want to take a, a moment to explain why this is good news. With over 60% of Vermont adults vaccinated, we're getting closer and closer to normal again. Why? Because vaccines work. If you need proof, just look at our declining hospitalizations, our death rate, and our seven-day case count average, which is the lowest it's been since November. And this is especially true for those 65 and older, which is now at over 90% vaccinated. If we keep it up, and I want to stress, if we keep this up, and are between 70 and 85% of adults vaccinated by June 1, we'll be able to take our final step when mandates become recommendations in July. I know there are some who think we should be moving a lot faster. And on the other side, there are those who want us to slow down. Even predicting the steps we took in late March and April would lead to more cases. But that proved not to be the case. That's because, as we've done from the very beginning, we are taking a science-based methodical approach. That's not to say we won't see a fluctuation of case growth along the way. We expect it, depending on conditions. What we're watching, though, is the hospitalization and death rate. This is the strategy that worked for us throughout the pandemic, and it will guide us until the end. So with that, I'll now turn it over to Secretary French for our weekly education update. Secretary French. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. I'll begin my update by reviewing the results of the PCR surveillance testing of school staff from this week. The number of staff participating in the testing has dropped off, probably as a result of the success of our school vaccination program. This week, uh, we tested 373 school staff. To date, the testing has identified no cases of COVID-19, which means the positivity rate is 0%. 
the statewide positivity rate remains very low at 1%. This will be the last week of surveillance testing for school staff, a program that started back in November. I want to thank our schools and the health department for all of their work in operating this program. It was one of several strategies that helped keep our communities and our schools safe this winter. We are now in the process of working with the health department to organize a pilot program for surveillance testing of students in schools and summer programs. We'll have more information on this program in the coming weeks. Our school districts have been engaged in a planning activity for the next phase of our response to the pandemic, what we are calling the recovery phase. Districts recently completed a general needs assessment as part of this larger recovery planning process, so I thought I'd provide an update on this work. We asked districts to give us a sense of their needs in three focus areas. First area, ask them to consider their needs relative to supporting the social and emotional needs of students, their mental health, and their overall well-being. Some districts identified specific professional development and training needs, such as a need for more trauma-informed uh, instructional practices. Many districts expressed an interest in improving their systems of student supports. Some school districts are planning on creating new recovery coordinator positions to manage these support systems at the district level. Other districts identified a need for more mental health counseling services and are working with their designated service agencies to develop plans to provide more services. Several districts said the number of referrals for student behavioral issues had decreased as a result of having students in smaller groups or pods. These districts intend to examine their schedules to consider to what extent pods could be utilized in the future. The second area districts assessed their needs was academics. Some of the needs identified in this area were specific to certain content areas, such as reading or math, where districts believe students will need additional direct instruction. A central theme in the academic area was the need to have better data on the status of student academic progress and achievement. Some districts expressed an interest in expanding their benchmark assessment systems, whereas others were interested in integrating the use of online learning platforms into the regular classroom so they could have more information on student academic progress. The third focus area for the needs assessment pertained to student engagement and truancy. There was a general observation that there were attendance issues across all groups of students during hybrid learning. Several districts observed engagement and truancy issues seem to be greater among disadvantaged or historically marginalized students. I expect we'll need to spend some focused effort at the state level to develop guidance and support in this area. This will need to include a review of our current truancy protocols. The next step in the planning process is to turn this general assessment information into planning priorities and from priorities into specific strategies for implementation. Our goal is for every district to have a recovery plan in place by June 1st. We intend to use the priorities emerging at the local level to inform the development of state priorities. A state level goal emerging already is a goal to develop a better integration of education and social service delivery systems and to see that integration well articulated in each region of the state. There are other permissible uses of federal dollars beyond the three focus areas described in our recovery planning process. In particular, there's a lot of interest among districts in using their local federal dollars to address school facilities issues related to the pandemic, such as improving indoor air quality. We are now working to set up the central coordination of school facilities work through the agency uh, to help districts in this area. We are working to do this quickly because contracts for this work need to be finalized this month and there are a limited number of contractors available to help design and install these types of systems. That concludes my report. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Shirley. Good morning. This morning I'll provide an update on our move to phase two of the Vermont Forward Plan. But to begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank and acknowledge the ongoing work of the Restart Team one among many in the pandemic response that has worked diligently multiple times per week since we emerged from stay home, stay safe early last year. This team has worked to develop and refine the science and data driven safety recommendations that have been a key component of the statewide effort for over a year. This team includes representatives from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, including the Department of Tourism and Marketing, the Agency of Natural Resources, Department of Financial Regulation, 
the Department of Health, the Department of Public Safety and Division of Emergency Management, the messaging and communications teams from all of those organizations, as well as private sector rec representatives uh, and is informed by external working groups and sector re representatives all working together to form the uh, fabric of the, uh, of the health and safety guidance that has guided Vermont for the last year. As vaccination of Vermonters continues, tomorrow marks another important milestone in our progress, the beginning of phase two of the Vermont Forward Plan, which includes two significant components. First, the second and final group of business sectors moves to universal guidance. Uh, and second, uh, revisions are made to the standards uh, regarding gatherings. Beginning tomorrow, May 1st, the following sectors move to universal guidance. Manufacturing, construction, and distribution operations, restaurants, catering, food service, and bars, religious facilities and places of worship, close contact businesses, which includes gyms, fitness centers, and the like, Sports, organized sports, including uh, youth leagues, adult leagues, uh, and that encompasses practices, games, and tournaments. Hair salons and barbershops. Indoor arts, arts, culture, and entertainment. And finally, meetings of public bodies. Please remember that while universal guidance transitions us away from specified capacity limits and some of the other nuanced guidance that has been present over the last year, the distancing requirement under universal guidance still remains and continues to apply. That means that safe distancing and crowd limitations are still important mitigation measures in most settings. With this move to phase two guidance, healthcare, education, and child care and summer camps continue to, to retain specialized guidance, but they're the only sectors that retain that detailed and nuanced guidance that exists beyond the universal safety standards that are so important in the COVID response. Also beginning tomorrow, gathering sizes will be updated uh, to mirror the following. Indoors, gatherings and events may include one unvaccinated person per 100 square feet, up to 150 people, plus any number of vaccinated persons. Outdoors, gatherings and event events may include up to 300 unvaccinated people, plus any number of vaccinated persons as well. Again, physical distancing and masking rem remain important safety measures for gatherings, both indoors uh, and outside. Quick reminder, as almost all sector sectors have shed their specified guidance, what universal guidance means. Stay home when you're sick, wear a mask in the presence of others, continue to ensure six foot spaces in uncrowded places, practice good hygiene, including frequent hand washing, and think before you travel and travel safely. As we continue to make progress toward more normalcy, Vermont's continued vigil vigilance remains the foundation of our efforts. In addition to universal guidance, the most important thing you can do for you, yourself, your family, and your community is to consider vaccination. Thank you, and now I'll turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Sherling, and good morning, everyone. I have a few updates to share with you this morning, and I'll start with a reminder that we are hosting a vaccine clinic for those age 16 and older at the Grand Isle Fire Department uh, this Saturday, May 1st, from 9.30 to 12. Appointments are still available. You can sign up online at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine, or you can call 855-722-7878 to make an appointment. We, are also, we also opened registration to out-of-state college students and part-time Vermont residents yesterday. We have scheduled a vaccine clinic at Middlebury High School today, and they are accepting walk-ins. Uh, there are open appointments in many areas this weekend, as well as on college campuses on the following dates. May 2nd at UVM, May 4th at Middlebury College and Bennington College, May 6th at St. Michael's College, May 7th at Northern Vermont University in Linden, May 8th at Castleton University. All eligible Vermonters age 16 and older can sign up for these clinics. Again, you can sign up online at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine, or you can make a phone call at 855-722-7878 to make an appointment. 
Turning to BIPOC Vermonters, we continue to make good progress. The gap continues to close and is now 7 percent between non-Hispanic whites and BIPOC Vermonters. As of today, 55 percent have either been vaccinated or have made an appointment. In terms of our overall progress, as of this morning, 335,500 people have been vaccinated against COVID-19. 101,900 have received their first dose of vaccine. 233,600 have received their first and last dose. If you have not made an appointment to receive your vaccine, I encourage you to sign up as soon as possible. It's the best way to end the pandemic and get back to normal. We have had great participation in the older age groups, but I want to bring this slide up uh, and show you that we are lagging somewhat in the age 18 to 29 year old age group who, who have been vaccinated or scheduled to be vaccinated. We are urging this age group to get vaccinated. In the upcoming weeks, there are plenty of opportunities to be vaccinated, so please take advantage of them. We have made great progress towards our Vermont Forward goals and have met the goal for May 1st, as the governor announced. In order to reach the next milestone, we will need all Vermonters, and particularly those 18 to 29, to get vaccinated. I also want to remind you to put your vaccination card in a safe place. I, recommended, I recommend taking a photo of it with your smartphone and keeping it handy, as you may need it if you decide to travel. If you lose your vaccination card, you can request a record of your vaccination from the registry uh, directly or through your health care provider. To request it through the registry, email vaxrecordrequest at vermont.gov or call 888-688-4667, option three. If you choose to have it sent to you by secure email, which will only take, a, you can choose to have it done two ways, uh, sent to you by secure email, which will only take a couple of hours, or by regular mail, which may take a week. I do wish to share an update on the general assistance housing plan for households experiencing homelessness. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the Department of Children and Families uh, temporarily expanded eligibility for uh, emergency housing through the General Emergency Assistance Program in response to the public health emergency. As we begin to emerge from the pandemic, this approach is neither financially nor uh, from a program perspective sustainable. Due to the pandemic, DCF greatly expanded the number of motels and hotels that participated in the temporarily, in temporarily housing Vermonters experiencing homelessness. To give you some context, on the coldest pre-pandemic nights in Vermont, DCF utilized 200 to 300 rooms. During the pandemic, we've been utilizing almost 2,000 rooms. As health guidance changes and more people are vaccinated, motels and hotels are beginning to return to serving travelers and tourists, reducing capacity for those experiencing homelessness. By July 1st, we will lose access to about 250 rooms, and we anticipate we'll lose an additional 400 rooms by October. We strongly believe that motels and hotels are not the long-term solution for people, but they are critical for short-term solutions for those that need emergency housing. We are investing in protecting and prioritizing the most vulnerable households, but we needed a transition plan. I would like to highlight that we have worked diligently and collaboratively with our community partners from the Vermont Coalition to End Homelessness, Vermont Community Action Partnership, Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition, Chittenden Homeless Alliance, Vermont Legal Aid, the Committee on Temporary Shelter and Groundworks Collaborative to develop the first step in the plan to transition individuals and families experiencing homelessness out of motels and hotels to more supportive long-term housing and services. We submitted the plan to the legislature last week. 
We arrived at consensus with our community partners, and we are very appreciative of their insight and participation. This transition plan is a two-step process, but, and this is very important, the nearly $40 million we need to even begin to implement this transition is contingent upon legislative approval of Governor Scott's proposal for $250 million dedicated to housing. We cannot move forward successfully with a transition plan unless the legislature approves Governor Scott's housing proposal. Now here is how we utilize the nearly $40 million to achieve the first step in the transition process. 40, four, <clears throat> excuse me, $4 million for motel uh, based housing support services, $4 million in rapid resolution and money for essentials to help households transition out of the motel, hotel um, supports, almost $30 million in motel costs, and $650,000 for security costs. The next step is to pr propose a transition plan for what happens after state fiscal year 2022. We are beginning to work on the next step in the transition plan, but there won't be any changes to the household, uh, changes to households currently in the motel, hotel uh, program until this July 1st. At this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine, who will provide a health update. Thank you. I'm pleased to report once again that COVID-19 activity in Vermont remains low. Though we are reporting 124 cases today, but this comes after 10 straight days of daily counts below 100. We are also faring well compared to the rest of the country. As of April 29th, Vermont's seven day case rate is 77.7 .7 cases per 100,000 compared to a national average of 110.8 cases per 100,000. The number of outbreaks our teams are following is markedly decreased. There is only one outbreak of small number in a long-term care facility. The positivity rate remains low at 1%. I'm pleased to report that hospitalizations have gone further lower uh, in the last couple days and are now 17 today with five in the ICU. Knowing that we're seeing less spread of COVID-19, along with our progress at getting Vermonters vaccinated, gives me a lot of confidence that we can continue along the Vermont forward path. This means easing some protocols, opening the spigot a bit, as the governor says, so Vermonters can begin to get back to their lives carefully and safety, as you've just heard. So following those same guiding principles, we are ready to adjust our own mask requirements for when people are outdoors, news that I'm sure will be welcomed by many. We've known for a number of months that being outdoors is safer. Past scientific data and more recently accumulating scientific data continue to support this. With less virus circulating and more people vaccinated, any small risk of transmission becomes even smaller. And we know more about the ways this virus can successfully be transmitted between people. This is why when you're now outdoors, masks will only be required when you're in a crowd or with multiple households where you can't keep a six foot distance from others. This is regardless of whether you are vaccinated or not. So if you're outside on a run or the family is on a hike or out for biking, or your kids have an outdoor play date, or you're on the sidelines watching a baseball game, or you're heading to the beach at a time that there's plenty of space around you, you are not required to wear a mask. But as before, if any of your activities turn into a crowded situation, have your mask with you in case you need it. As we move into a time with fewer restrictions, it means Vermonters will have to make more of their own decisions 
about how to keep themselves safe and those around them. So here's a rule of three to keep in mind. Outside, masked, distanced. You need two of these three elements. For example, if you're outside and distanced, you do not need to wear a mask. If you're outside and not distanced, wear a mask. And if you're not outside, you should wear a mask and keep a distance. Pretty basic. This is all part of our new normal, evolving with the pandemic as our best tool to bring it to an end does its job. And by that I mean, of course, vaccination. We continue to be extremely proud of the progress we've made in getting Vermonters vaccinated, and we will continue to work to overcome any potential barriers for those who are not yet vaccinated. You're already hearing some of these strategies at work, from a drive through clinic to allowing people to walk into certain clinics. We're also facilitating clinics, as you just heard, on college campuses. We recognize there is not a one-size-fits-all approach to vaccination, and we will keep exploring ways to meet Vermonters where they are, to make it as easy as possible for them to get their shot. When this effort is over, the last thing we want to find out is that someone could not get vaccinated due to issues like scheduling, or time of day, or convenience, or drive time, or location. And not only is the state concerned about this, but we know that many Vermont campuses, businesses, and work sectors are equally concerned and want to work with us to make Vermont as safe a place as possible and achieve the highest rate of vaccination we can. As always, and just as important, you can help too. Not only by getting vaccinated, if you have not done so as yet and are eligible, but if someone you know has questions, listen to them with empathy and without judgment. It's normal to have questions with any treatment, any vaccine, and especially a new vaccine. And unfortunately, there is a lot of misinformation out there. Try asking them open-ended questions, and then ask permission to share information from trusted sources about their specific concerns. Believe it or not, that can go a long way towards increasing a person's confidence. And, if, and you've heard me say this before, help them find their own reason to get vaccinated. It might be different from your own reason or even what you'd think it would be for them. Even those of us in the public health world know people close to us who haven't yet found that reason. One of my employees shared recently that her son had not yet gotten vaccinated. It was clearly not something his peer group was focused on or talking much about. She told him that she wanted him to think about what it would mean if he couldn't visit his grandmother or did visit her and potentially caused harm because he was unvaccinated. Well, he happens to work at a grocery store with a pharmacy. And shortly after that conversation, while he was at work, he just grabbed a shot. Seeing and protecting his grandmother mattered to him, and getting the shot was easy. It was time for him to have found the right reason and do the right thing. Which brings me to thinking about anything you can do to make it easier for someone else to get vaccinated, whether it's offering, offering a ride, offering to watch their kids, helping them to make the appointment, or keeping an eye out for a walk-in clinic that is suited for them. You truly can be a trusted messenger and make a difference. And helping a friend or family member get vaccinated not only helps you, but helps the entire state. Because the more people who are vaccinated, the quicker we can get to the end of this pandemic. Governor? Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Starting with Calvin Cutler, WCAX. Um, thanks, Governor. So as you probably saw, the uh, Senate approved a little over a $7 billion budget yesterday. Um, on, on the service level, I mean, what, what do you make of it and sort of how some of the money is spent and, and where it's spent? 
Well, first of all, it went through second reading. I don't think it's been fully um, voted on. I don't, I don't believe that'll happen until maybe tomorrow. But having said that, um, I have a lot of concerns uh, with the budget, uh, mainly around the ARPA funding, this once in a, in a lifetime opportunity with a billion dollars um, to put towards things, the tangible things that I think are so necessary uh, that will be transformational uh, in so many ways if we do it right. And I don't think they're doing it right. So uh, a lot of the initiatives are um, some that we, uh, we all agree on, uh, but I think they're using too much of it, um, a, a lot of it, uh, for programmatic needs, uh, for one-time budgetary expenses. And uh, at a time when we have uh, about $300 million of surplus money from this fiscal year, $300 million, I don't think we need to use this one-time ARPA money for some of those initiatives. So uh, there's still time. We'll see what some of the debate is on the third reading in the Senate, see if there's any changes that will be made then. If not, um, it is vastly different than the House uh, passed bill. I'm sure that ARPA hadn't passed when they um, put their initiative over, their budget over to the Senate. So I'm sure that they have ideas as well. We'll be connecting with them uh, to uh, make our um, argument, so to speak, for why we think it should change. So it's got a long ways to go, um, but, uh, but again, uh, some good provisions in there, uh, but many that I have concerns about. Probably a question I'd say for either you or Secretary Smith um, about the um, program for people experiencing homelessness and how to phase that out. Um, maybe for Secretary Smith, um, you know, how, how does the, the state, you know, intend to deal with, um, you know, ongoing security uh, concerns from some of these hotels and potentially also um, the cost of, of damage in, in some rooms too? Uh, well, uh, I'll let Secretary Smith answer that, but this is a good example of where we're, I believe we're moving in the wrong direction, the Senate propo uh, proposed budget. We, uh, we spent with FEMA dollars, emergency dollars, uh, over $70 million for temporary housing for the homeless uh, through the pandemic over the last year. Um, with our proposal, I'm saying let's use a quarter of the billion dollars. Let's use $250 million to put towards housing. And half of that, half of that to provide permanent housing for those who are homeless because that will do a number of things. It will give them some security for the future, not just temporary housing, not a Band-Aid on the issue that we find ourselves in, but more permanent housing that has plagued us for quite some time. It will also save us money in the future because we can't afford to continue uh, to provide for over $70 million. Some uh, projections go to $100 million a year of expense. We need permanent housing for those who are homeless. And this budget uh, that we propose, this, this plan, this ARPA plan, would provide for that to save us money and give those uh, who are homeless uh, some more security in the future. Secretary Smith. Yeah, Kevin, I think the governor uh, explained it well. We, we're in a transition year um, where we're going to be putting some restrictions back into the program in terms of the front door getting into the program, uh, but also at the same time, as the governor said, uh, building uh, permanent housing. And what more can be um, uh, done for people that are homeless than providing uh, permanent housing? That, that's the solution. Uh, in the meantime, as we do put restrictions on the front door, some uh, eligible people will be, you know, will be ramping back up the shelter capacity uh, that we have out there. Uh, we also will be looking at other rental assistance capacity that we have. Um, we are all, always concerned about security. Uh, we have put money into into the sort of the the temporary year-long um, transition period for security. And we will look at, um, at hotels and, and motels and uh, talk to them about any sort of damages that, that are made there. 
Uh, we haven't made any commitments, but you know we are um, we are committed to be good neighbors here as we as we transition out of this program as it currently exists. And I have one follow what, what is the plan if uh, the legislature doesn't approve this funding? What what's the plan for this uh, this program or phasing it out? And I guess is you know Governor is is your uh, signature of, of the budget or your final approval of the budget is it contingent on this? Well, let me talk to the plan and then I'll let the governor um, uh, go ahead or I'll do whatever the governor tells me. Uh, but the, um, the one thing that there has been unanimous sort of approval of this transition plan that we're talking about from housing advocates, from other advocates, and I think generally acceptance from the legislature on this one year tra uh, transition plan. As I said in my remarks, it is really imperative. This transition plan is built on a one-year transition that ultimately um, moves people to permanent housing. So the second phase of this is really tied to this housing program, and we need to build um, adequate housing, both adequate housing, and the governor has proposed $90 million of housing for the homeless. Just think about this. The 250 that the governor had proposed is one of the, is the largest, in my memory, is the largest housing initiative ever proposed in this state. And 90 of that is for the homeless, plus 12 million for shelter capacity of, above and beyond the 150 that we are going to be reinstituting that was shut down during the pandemic. So um, as the governor mentioned, this second phase is, is critically important to the success of the first phase. And I'll let the governor talk about, well. Uh. Well, again, as I said, uh, Calvin, I'm hoping that we can make some ground up with the, uh, uh, with the House in particular, or it gets into a conference committee, and uh, then we'll go from there. Uh, but, uh, but I feel strongly uh, about these dollars. I think we need a bold vision, and I provided for that. I haven't seen the vision from the legislature. I just see a piecemeal approach. And if we're receiving a billion dollars, and they're spending about half of that in this fiscal year. I mean, this doesn't happen. It's, won't happen again, I don't believe. Uh, we have an opportunity to really, really make a difference here in the state. Uh, and so uh, the, th the three things that I think need to be included is that transparency I talked about. They've done that. I'll give them credit for that. Uh, creating a separate section in the, uh, in the appropriations bill. Um, I think it has to be transformative. We know what the problems are in the state. We've talked about them. We've debated them. I think we've agreed on them. Um, we just haven't had the resources to do anything about it, whether it's broadband or housing or water and sewer and storm water. I mean, all of those things, climate change mitigation. I mean, we agree on all of those. So transformative is important, uh, but tangible from my perspective is important as well. That's where we shouldn't be using this money. It's, it's borrowed money. I mean. We're going to have to pay it back. Somebody's got to pay it back um, for budgetary holes. You know, I mean, this is not an ongoing expense. These are things that we need to invest in and get the the, the most return on investment as a result. So, uh, nothing is certain. I certainly, uh, I, I feel it's my responsibility as governor to protect this money and to make a difference uh, for Vermonters. Well, you stole some of my questions, but anyway, <laughs> with the uh, with the gap in the uh, or the the number of 18 year olds and and young younger folks, 16 to 18, that are that are not choosing to take a uh, a vaccine, what can be done, or is there a plan in place? Are you looking at marketing? Are you looking at maybe taking the vaccine to the schools? Um, how are we combating that? I guess you know, it's interesting when you look at the graph. Uh, and see the number of uh, 16 to 18 year olds, 53% uh, uh, outdoing the 18 to 29 by a number of points. I mean, that's pretty remarkable that they're doing the right thing. Uh, the 18 to 29 
uh, year olds are the problem from my perspective. And I've thought about this a lot. I mean, we're going to use uh, all kinds of different methods. We want to meet them where they are. We want to use education. We want to do, make it easy for people to have to be vaccinated. But at the end of the day, it's about doing the right thing. I mean, we have, again, look at the, the rates here. Look at the, the 65 and over, um, over 90%. Um, and I think a lot about public service what you should be doing for your state and country, stepping up to do the right thing. I think about all those who serve their country in different ways. Um, my dad, World War II. I think about those, the greatest generation, uh, what they were faced with at the time, same age group, 18 to 29, being asked to, I mean, asked to. That wasn't forced. They stepped up, signed up, and uh, knowing that they would be gone for quite some time, years in some respects. Didn't know when they would get back. Um, they were going to be in harm's way. They were going to be going into battle. They were going to be shot at. Um, they were going to be wounded. Some of them would, be, would not come back uh, because of death on the battlefield. Um, but they did so willingly. They stepped up and took a tremendous sacrifice stepping up to do the right thing over a multitude of years. All we're asking of this group, this 18 to 29 year old uh, grouping, is to have one shot, do one thing, step up to help everyone else. And I don't think it's too much to ask. So we're going to be doing everything we can uh, to try and incentivize, uh, to try and educate, and uh, try and get to where they are to figure out why not, what's, what's the problem with doing the right thing uh, for other members of the society. Dr. Levine. Yeah. We're not standing still on this, as the governor mentioned, um, and as Dr. Levine mentioned, making it convenient um, in order to get a vaccine so that there is no excuse not to get a vaccine. As I mentioned, we are on college campuses. Those uh, clinics are open to everyone, uh, but obviously we are targeting this age group that we talked about, 18 to 29, uh, in, that, uh, in that target. But I just, uh, we're doing a lot of other things. We had um, really good success at Barton um, this this week um, in terms of the drive-through. We're going to continue that process as well. Um, you'll see us at Tunbridge Fair on May 8th um, using uh, a drive-through sort of process. We're also mitigate, we're also sort of merging um, the concept of registration and walk-ins together. Now we won't have uh, as much walk-ins as we would during registration, but we are starting to merge walk-ins uh, as a philosophy to, um, to help uh, mitigate that age group in particular. So we'll have uh, drive-throughs where the Tunbridge Fair is uh, uh, May 8th. Uh, we're looking at uh, a joint venture with, uh, with New Hampshire and, and Lancaster, New Hampshire. We're looking at Lamoille, Johnson, Franklin County, Highgate, Guilford. Um, we're also, we have a mobile unit uh, that we've used. We're looking at uh, May 8th being at Devil's Bowl and uh, May 8th uh, being at Bear Ridge. At, these are um, racetracks here in, uh, in the state. We had great success in Essex County on sort of that barnstorming tour that we did throughout using EMS. We're gonna, we're gonna do that again on uh, May 8th and 9th in Essex County, but we're also gonna do it in other counties as well. As I, re as I mentioned, we're on various sites on college campuses, and we're also looking at the various areas that we can go for um, businesses, restaurants, workplaces, uh, bringing the, uh, the vaccine to people and to those spaces where people um, get outside, uh, Church Street, um, the, the waterfront, 
uh, to encourage vaccine. And of course, we'll be reaching out to the vulnerable as we have with BIPOC and the migrant community, but also we're starting to uh, make progress in the homeless community, maybe even meal sites, um, distribution sites that we'll talk about in, probably in the future. And those are the sort of things that we're doing. Merging walk-ins, merging uh, registration, um, and, and using, as Dr. Levine, and I'll turn it over to him, talking about the communication aspect of this, not only making it convenient, but also communicating to people why this is important. And I'll turn that over to Dr. Levine. Yeah, I think Secretary Smith covered the list pretty well. Uh, and in my opening comments, I talked a little bit about the communication as well. Um, there is a need to combat misinformation for sure. And uh, that's part of a strategy all along, uh, but maybe particularly uh, specific to this age demographic as well. So we have to be very uh, cognizant of that. But a lot of the theme you've heard is making sure that we meet the person where they are. And if there's a large work site and uh, people can't get to a vaccine center to uh, be vaccinated, we obviously want to meet them as uh, appropriate and not rule anything out. The one thing you haven't heard, so the doctor will talk about it for a second, is the remainder of the healthcare system being involved. Now, frankly, uh, we still do not have uh, sufficient levels of vaccine coming in on allocations to give it to every healthcare provider in the state and have them be uh, a major focus. There is going to be that transition at some point in time, but that's not part of this current strategy. Uh, and I would argue again that the demographic we were talking about isn't likely to be at the doctor's office anyways. Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, they will not be a key part of this, uh, especially with uh, the advent of perhaps the 12 to 15 year old age group we're already working with our pediatrics colleagues who will play a big role in the pre-phase of getting the vaccine to that audience and to their parents as well, talking with them. Um, the other part of the healthcare system is in enterprises like Church Street, as was mentioned, um, partnering with others uh, in healthcare communities around the state who can help deliver the vaccine and do the education and messaging as well. So we've got a lot on the table, uh, and we're not uh, standing still by any means. Thank you. Stuart Ledbetter, NBC5. Thank you. Um, Governor, you've said that a business, a private business, can opt to require a proof of vaccination. Um, would you encourage businesses to require that proof? Would that get younger people who might, say, want to get into a bar or go to a concert to get the vaccine? Well, again, I think uh, it's up to the business and what uh, they think is right for them. I'm not going to tell them what to do. Um, but uh, as we have said uh, during this next uh, step in the plan, uh, that uh, we are going to allow for, let's say, outdoor gatherings a certain amount. I think it's 300 uh, right now, outside gatherings. Uh, and then uh, that's unvaccinated. And then any number of uh, vaccinated over that. So I would think it would be in the best interests of a, a business who wants to, uh, to have a larger gathering um, to find out who is vaccinated and who is not. Um, the masking is another uh, aspect of this. Uh, it's not just about vaccinations, but if a, if a business feels strongly about continuing to have a mask policy, um, then we, think that they should take that step, but that's up to them. It's not us telling them what to do. And I think that that's something we have to keep in mind as we move forward. We're in the last laps of this very la long race, and I've said it before. Um, there's going to become a time when, and it's, it's happening, we have to transition to that, where we have to take self-responsibility. We're going to have to take responsibility for our actions and what we do to protect ourselves and our families and others. Uh, and that's what we're going to have after the 4th of July if we get enough people vaccinated. Um, so at that point, uh, everyone's going to have to make decisions based on what they think 
is the right thing to do. So no, you won't tell businesses, but would you, do you have any feeling personally, you wouldn't encourage businesses to require proof? Well, again, I think they have to do what they think is right. It's about that self-responsibility uh, that I talked about. And, uh, you know, we have told people for the last 14 months what to do. I think it's time now for others to start thinking about what they think is the right thing to do for their clientele and their uh, employees and their customers. Uh, if I could ask you just about the, the motel voucher and the transition program. I mean, you want to move folks and motels want to reclaim their rooms in many cases and you want them to move into permanent housing, but that'll take some time. What does temporary housing mean? What does it look like? Yeah, I'll, I'll let uh, Secretary Smith answer that. But but again, um, I feel strongly, uh, and again, I, I don't think anybody disagrees on this issue. Uh, I think that we have wanted to uh, try and solve the homeless problem uh, here in the state with different means. But now we have an opportunity. We have, we have a billion dollars here um, but it's going to take a bold vision in order to, to really um, make the right investments in the right places. And I think housing is a perfect example of that, using $250 million for housing, something we all agree on. Think back about uh, two years ago, we took out that bond. I presented that to the legislature. They went along with it, $37 million bond. It leveraged another 65 million in private assets, making it the single largest investment in housing we've ever seen. We thought $100 million was a lot of money, which it is uh, at the time. Um, but now we have an opportunity to really make another dent and maybe solve some issues with another $250 million. So, so again, that's why I feel so strongly about all of this. We know what the problems are in the state. We've talked about them a lot. But now it takes bold leadership and vision in order to accomplish uh, what we think is, is the right thing to do. And then not look back uh, five, five, six years from now and say, where'd the billion dollars go? Where, where did it all go? I don't, where did we spend it? And uh, I don't want to be in that position. Dr. Smith. Stuart, as I mentioned, July 1st, we'll start um, putting eligibility requirements into the housing program during the, the pandemic. The height of the pandemic, we didn't have eligibility criteria. We had opened it up to those um, that were in need or said they were in need. And um, as, as a consequence, we, are, we occupied about 2,000 um, rooms uh in order to house people those rooms as i mentioned before aren't going to be available so where once we start putting eligibility criteria in um what what happens well in many cases we'll still be over the course of this year be using hotel motels at a reduced capacity than what we have been but still at a 30 million dollar level um over the course just to give you some context pre-pandemic uh, we were spending somewhere in the neighborhood of five to seven million, and my numbers may mean not be precise, but it's in that range, five to seven million. We'll be doing 30 million over the next year, plus another uh, $10 million on other things like um, the availability of flexible uh, rapid resolution dollars that can help identify safe uh, housing options for those that don't qualify for the program. Uh, and also a cash assistance program to help those uh, to get essential needs for households uh, as, as they don't qualify for the general assistance program. The other thing that we're doing is we're, as, as, you, as I mentioned, we're bringing on the shelter capacity again uh, in um, about 150 beds uh, statewide and then of course, you know, in the year, um, in the next year, we'll be bringing on another 200 uh, new shelter beds. The the availability of rental assistance, which we, which has been expanded great, expanded greatly by the federal government, really means an unprecedented opportunity to help people in permanent housing as well. So, although we're closing the sort of the front door 
uh, not closing, although we're bringing some criteria to the front door of the general assistance program. By the way, the general assistance program was never intended to be sort of a permanent housing program. It was intended to help people that were in need for a particular night. But we, as I mentioned, we expanded it during the pandemic. As we start putting uh, back um, various criteria for the front door of this program, um, we are expanding other programs to help those that don't qualify for this program for the for the for the year period. The long-term solution is what the governor talked about. There is no other substitute other than permanent housing uh, for those that are experiencing homelessness. And the governor has put forth a proposal that this state has never seen before, and something that I think. Um, we, it will take a year to implement, but uh, we have the transition plan in place in order to make this happen. Okay, thank you very much. Lisa, the AP. Uh, thank you. This is a question for Commissioner Harrington. Is he on the line? I believe he is. I am. Hi. Um, yes, I am. What about the, the U.S. Department of Labor ordering the state to review those, the eligibility of those past unemployment claims? Um, I know you've asked the Department of Labor to reverse that order. Is there any update? And has the state um, reactivated that able and available eligibility uh, trigger? Uh, so to your question and for clarification, um, there were a number of eligibility criteria um, that were uh, in place at the start of the pandemic and prior to the pandemic. Um, obviously, many states with the claim surge that happened uh, chose to bypass some of those triggers as it would be sending massive amounts of claims to adjudication. Um, and what we were finding is that a majority of claimants were simply answering the question incorrectly. So upon review, uh, we would actually deem them to be eligible anyways, even though they had said they were not able and available. Um, so Vermont, like many other states, um, chose to uh, bypass that trigger and allow those claims to process to avoid um, significant backlogs uh, and bottlenecks in the system. Um, the federal government and the U.S. Department of Labor has been um, interacting with states across the country, um, conducting performance audits, uh, and identifying areas of corrective action. Uh, this is one of them, and, and Vermont uh, was identified as uh, needing to implement a corrective action. One, to re-implement um, or reactivate the able and available uh, eligibility criteria, which we have done. Um, so claims that do go through and, and individuals that um, identify that they are not able and available for work, uh, not willing to accept work if offered, and who don't have a, a COVID qualifying circumstance um, will will not be eligible or will need to be a, have their claim adjudicated for further information. Um, but uh, to the bigger question, uh, and that is um, the federal government has indicated that these states who have bypassed eligibility triggers now need to go back and review any claims that were bypassed um, and adjudicate those claims and, and issue formal determinations on those claims. Um, Vermont uh, submitted a, an appeal to the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Labor asking them to waive that requirement. Uh, our congressional delegation supported us in that effort uh, and also issued a formal letter uh, to the Secretary. Um, however, at this time, we have not heard, heard back or heard a response on that. Okay, and then if if, the, if you do have to go through with this, and the, and anyone is found to have been overpaid, how would that be handled? Would they get yeah, so there are two can yeah, you pick up on this in the future, or would they have to pay it back? Yeah, you you pick up on two concerns that we have. One is the enormity of the situation. So yeah. um, depending on what we can coordinate with the U.S. Department of Labor and what they would actually require us to do, um, it could be a population as small as 10,000 people that we have to review, um, or it could be a population the size of you know, 90,000 people or 1.25 million weekly claims that we would have to review. Um, again, mm -hmm. I don't think it will be on the upper end of that. It'll probably be on the lower end of that, but that will... Um, 
uh, come out as part of our negotiation with the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, they have indicated in their letter um, that if we were to identify someone as having been uh, ineligible, that we marked eligible, um, that person should be put in overpayment and have to repay those benefits to both the state and the federal government. Um, the department uh, remains um, uh, steadfast in its position that um, whenever um, the state uh, is the one who initiated the overpayment, um, the individual should be held harmless. Uh, and traditionally, unless we're directed otherwise, um, if, you know, if someone received benefits because of either a department error or because the department intentionally um, allowed the claim to proceed, like we did in this case, um, we would typically uh, waive any overpayment obligation. However, um, I think that's another piece where we, we have to wait to see whether or not the federal government will allow us to do that. I see. And then just one last thing um, about the, this is another unrelated question. Oh, I guess uh, about this, are, do you know if other states are, are seeking to have the federal government waive, waive this for them? Uh, I don't know if any have submitted a formal appeal. Um, I do know other states are extremely concerned about this mm -hmm. and have had regular conversations with the U.S. Department of Labor to try to navigate this, uh, but I can't speak to whether they've submitted a formal appeal or not. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Lisa, if thank I you. Just, I'd just like to add a little bit of context to this as well. And this is sure. where I'll probably get in trouble with our legal um, counsel. But... Um, you know, if you think back a year, um, we were jammed up. Um, there were a number of uh, claimants waiting for money to survive. And, uh, and I remember um, feeling as though we couldn't do what they wanted us to do because of our mainframe, our 50-year-old mainframe, uh, all the workaround, all the things we had to, to do uh, to get compliance through. So that was really... Uh, really a bottleneck in the system and, uh, and preventing us from sending checks to those who are in desperate need. And I remember a lot of pressure from the legislature at the time, uh, I think the media as well, I mean, and rightfully so. Um, we were frustrated. So finally, uh, we made, I made uh, one of the decisions um, <clears throat> to take advantage of some of those workarounds. What can we do to work around some of the issues that we we're facing to prevent, that was preventing us from sending checks out? And um, mm -hmm. they weren't going to be without risks. Uh, and, and we decided to take those risks. And I, at the time we notified, uh, I made sure that I, I spoke with the, the pro tem and the speaker and let them know that uh, we were we were doing something that was a little out of the ordinary, unorthodox, um, and this could lead to some issues in the future. Um, but but it was a risk worth taking. I called uh, I called and spoke directly to each one of our uh, congressional uh, members of our congressional delegation and told them the same thing um, that we were taking this um, because we knew Vermonters were in desperate need, uh, and uh, I said we may need you in the future. Uh, because uh, we know that this is counter uh, to what the U.S. Department of Labor uh, would, uh, would find acceptable. But we thought it was necessary. And so here we are uh, today, and, uh, and I still believe we did the right thing a year ago uh, to try and get checks out to needy Vermonters. Uh, but this is as a result. Now we're faced uh, trying to m appeal to the Biden administration uh, to make sure uh, that we hold people harmless and that uh, they understand we were in a crisis situation at the time through no fault of our own. And because of a 50-year-old mainframe and all of the hoops and hurdles that we would have had to go through, um, we just couldn't, we couldn't make it work uh, without having Vermonters suffer. So again, that's why we're in the position we're in today. Um, I'll take some responsibility for that but I still think it was the right thing to do. Thank you. Aaron Calvin, store reporter. Hi, um, yes, yeah, my question is um, about, you know, once the 
um, once everyone is widely vaccinated or the vaccine is widely distributed, is there any concern that there, you know, may continue to be outbreaks or um, continued spread of the virus from, um, you know, organizations that ideologically don't want to be vaccinated or oppose the vaccine, such as, you know, um, particularly conservative religious groups or anything like that? Dr. Levine. Yeah, thanks for that question. The, um, the reality is um, you're describing what I would call pockets of people who are not vaccinated, but in a sea of hopefully lots of people who are vaccinated who will be very much protected from any serious consequence. If you look at the experience, and I'm, this is a reasonably but not totally fair comparison. If you look at the experience with measles, a disease we thought we almost had gotten rid of at one point, but as you frame it, there were very focused groups that were resistant um, to getting the vaccine. Where did we see outbreaks? We saw it in those focused groups. We didn't see it necessarily spread widely through communities, but there were concerns and a lot of public health interventions to make sure that didn't happen. It's a long way of my saying public health isn't going to forget about this pandemic and lose track of it and, you know, th things will quiet down and uh, we'll just sit back and go check mark, we're done with that. Um, this is going to be part of the environment for the foreseeable future. We just hope it will be a very minor, minimal part of the environment for the foreseeable future so that if anything did pop up in a specific population, we would be able to attend to it rapidly and control it, keep it contained, and uh, make sure that the rest of the greater community was as safe as it needed to be, superimposed on the safety they already had by having a good vaccination rate. I can't say we have you know, identified, um, we'll call that pockets of resistance in Vermont at this point that we're especially focused on. Okay, so um, nothing of that sort. All set, Aaron? Yep, sounds good. Thank you. Pete Herschel, DPR. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Secretary Smith, earlier you said that 55% of BIPOC Vermonters have received received at least one dose of the vaccine. I'm looking at the vaccine dashboard um, updated this morning at the Department of Health, and it says 48.6% of BIPOC Vermonters have received at least one dose of the vaccine, and I'm hoping you can help me reconcile the difference. I can't hear, Peter, but uh, I will reconcile the difference for you on what, what is the difference. I got. I got the uh, information from the same people who uh, update the, uh, uh, the website, so let me uh, figure out what's going on. Uh, I appreciate that. Jason, I believe oh. it was 55 who are, got the first dose for our scheduled to get the first dose, yep. and that's the gap. Let me, let me just check on that, Peter. Okay, yeah, that might explain it. Uh, thank you, I'll, I'll look forward to a follow-up. Um, second question, I don't know if this is for Secretary Smith or Commissioner Levine, but um, vaccination rates among males in Vermont are lagging considerably behind women, um, 10 percentage points, in fact. And I'm wondering if you've been able to ferret out the reason for that difference um, and, and if you're trying to do anything about it. Well, we've noticed the difference um, in, in males as we notice the difference in age groups as well. Um, and as Dr. Levine had talked about, we, we are about ready to launch in the next few weeks a campaign that talks um, peer on peer of why vaccination is important. That will include males. Um, it will include young people. It will include others as well. 
um, to talk about why that is important. I would suspect there's demographic reasons as well, but um, I, you know, I don't have anything specific unless Dr. Levine has something he wants to add to that. Uh, the only thing I would add to that is, you know, most traditionally in all the metrics we follow in healthcare, um, women do adhere more, and women have more contact with the healthcare system. Uh, so getting a vaccination may be more part and parcel of what they would do anyways. Um, but that doesn't tell you what's preventing the male from actually going that extra step. And um, it doesn't seem to be as prevalent in the higher age demographics. You know, when we look at, it, at the data, since there's such high coverage in those demographics, so it does seem to be skewed towards a younger age demographic. Um, we haven't especially focused on sex as the dividing line there with why that age group is not doing as well. Um, as the Secretary said, we've done much more just thinking about the age group in general. Um, but part of the uh, communication strategy and part of the um, information campaign, if you will, combating misinformation, uh, we'll be looking at the peer-on-peer, -peer and males will certainly be prominent. That's about all I can tell you at this point. Uh, can you talk about where that misinformation is coming from? Yes, the Internet. Uh, <laughs> if I could just put it out there. Uh, there's so much on the Internet, and uh, <clears throat> One, one has to be very, very um, concerned about what they're looking at and uh, be able to vouch for the veracity of it. Uh, there are, you know, every aspect of the pandemic is well represented on the Internet from should you get a vaccine to why isn't a certain treatment being used more often than it is towards is there really a pandemic at all, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Um, so we, we're able to combat things when they're, we're confronted with them, but when an individual uh, is focused on what they've read, uh, it's very, very challenging. Um, and they may not be the kind of individual who's going to listen to a reputable resource, whether it's us up here, whether it's you uh, at VPR or others in the media, uh, who at least may provide a more balanced picture. Uh, they're only going to get the one side. So, that's where I see most of the misinformation coming from. Thank you all. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor, the uh, Attorney General, of course, announced earlier this week that uh, Vermont had reached a settlement with strategic IT partners over this. Uh, robocall scam as they directed the calls into Vermonters. Um, I was trying to get information on if there's any data on how many Vermonters were actually scammed and what that total expense to them was. I don't have that information, Tom. Um, we might be able to get that for you or maybe the Attorney General would be the appropriate place to find that, but um, I just don't have it. Um, Anybody else have it? Commissioner Sherling? No. no. He's shaking his head no. Um, we'll do our best to find it, but I, I, that may be a, a better question for the AG. Thank you. Yeah, I submitted the question to the AG. I did not receive a response I, because I was also curious that while it sounded like they're getting a settlement for $67,000 uh, wasn't bad, I wondered if that money was, it's not going to be 67, it's strategic IT partners follows through and closes up shop, it's only going to be 7000 but also if that money is earmarked for distribution to people that they know got scammed, if I could find that out as well. Okay. I'll, I'll do, we'll do our best to send the message along to the, uh, to the AG. Okay. Thanks very much. Have a great weekend. You too. Joseph Gresser, the Barton Chronicle.
Joe Gresser. All right, we'll move to Eric from the Times Argus. Yes, Governor, this is about the return to work requirement. This also might be a question for Commissioner Harrington. I got a call yesterday from a reader who worked in the ho works in the hotel industry and had her hours cut from full-time to part-time because of the pandemic. She's expected to return to full-time work this summer once things open back up. But now that she has to search for work, she's concerned that she might lose her first job because she has to find a second job. Uh, so what should people who are currently working part-time jobs that are expected to return to full-time, what should they do in a situation like this? Commissioner Harrington. Gov Governor, I'm happy to answer that. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. So um, we certainly don't expect anyone to have to give up their current existing job unless they would choose to. So they have a couple options. Really what we're saying is the work search and unemployment in general is about returning people to receiving full-time employment. So that full-time employment can be through one employer or it can be through multiple employers. So in this case, if someone has a part-time job, they're not required to go out and look for full-time work. They can go out and look for additional part-time work that gets them to a full-time employment and off of eventually off of unemployment benefits. So in this case, this individual could retain their part-time job um, and simply look for additional part-time work to help carry them over uh, until their, their summer employment begins. Um, it is a question that has come up. This is pretty standard in how the, the program has been operated uh, in the past. And again, um, they can be very open and honest with the employers they're um, conducting their work search with, letting them know that they also have another part-time job and, um, you know, and that they may only be available for hours on a particular day or hours during a particular time of day um, because of an already existing employment condition. Um, and that would still satisfy the work search requirement if they were simply looking at very specific uh, additional hours or additional um, uh, employment. Okay. One of her concerns was turning down a job because it might impact the first job. So she wouldn't lose her benefits if she turned down a job because it might cost her the first one. Yeah. So I would personally, I would classify that under. Um, you know, the, the caveat there is refusing suitable work. And so in this case, if let's say she had a job already existing that was Monday through Thursday and she was looking for a part-time job that occurred on Friday uh, or over the weekend, um, and that second job uh, then came out with a schedule or was willing to offer her work for work on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, um, if she declined that job because it would interfere with her already existing job, um, it would not be considered a refusal of suitable work um, because it, it was not exactly what she was looking for in that case. Okay, thank you. Sure. Kat, WCAX. Hi, are these pop-up or walk-in clinics that you're holding using up all of their vaccine doses or are there leftover doses at the end of the day? And if so, what happens to those? I believe a number of them are still continuing to use the uh, Johnson Johnson. So there's no wastage there. And, and I, I believe we're using up all the others. So there's no wastage either. But I'll let Secretary Smith answer that. You know, as Kat, thank you for the question. As we try to um, expand both walk-ups and, uh, and the, the registration aspect, the end of the day probably will be less problematic uh, as we move forward. So they'll probably, you know, what we'll try to do is use Johnson & Johnson, those that we don't use, you know, Johnson Johnson can be stored a lot easier. In other instances, um, I don't think we're gonna have this, you know the same issue of uh, calling around anymore with the with the front end walk ups that we have if we do we'll we'll deal with it but i don't foresee that being an issue anymore um in, in terms of what how we're planning these uh uh these um, uh, these events we certainly didn't have the up uh, that problem in the events that we've planned so far 
So they're filling up. Yeah, they're filling up or we're filling them up by announcing that there's spots like I did with Grand Isle today um, by uh, talking about that we have slots available set Saturday, May 1st from 9.30 to 12. Um, we've been very, pretty successful in when we're starting to see slots to uh, fill them by either moving up appointments or um, having the walk-ins take some of the uh, doses that normally would take place at the end of the day. How would you characterize our supply and demand right now? Are we still having a demand that, uh, that exceeds our supply? Yes, I would, I would say that's the case. At, at some point, um, we'll probably have that reversed, but um, right now, um, not, you know, other states are having problems with uh, demand. We're not one of those states. We're still seeing strong demand. I'd like to see stronger demand in the 18 to 29 year old uh, bracket. Um, and that's why we've been talking about it uh, a, a little bit more. But as you can see on our graph, we've had very strong demand at the higher age levels. Um, really moderate to strong demand uh, coming down until the 18 to 29 year olds. And that's where I really would urge everybody uh, that are in that age group to get vaccinated. So right now, demand does, right at this moment, demand does uh, outstrip supply. I have a last quick question here from a viewer who wanted to know, um, for teenagers ages 16 and 17, she says they need their parents' permission for a COVID vaccine, um, but she says they're not required to have parental input for some other healthcare choices that they need to make. So. She's kind of wondering why the barrier of parental permission is needed here, especially, of course, while we're encouraging young people to get the COVID vaccine. And if you are concerned that that might be deterring some young people who might want to get vaccinated from getting vaccinated. Well, just remember, this is a um, this was approved on a uh, emergency order. Um, this vaccine, we want uh, uh, parental input into this. Um, I haven't, you know, as we saw on the graph, we've had pretty good uptake in the 16 and 17 year olds. Um, parental, I don't think uh, parental uh, s sort of um, uh, permission has prevented that sort of uptake to continue. So, uh, you know, I, I understand if there's a concern about a 16 or 17 year old, but at the same time, I think this is an important enough decision that we, we have uh, parental guidance here um, as we uh, as we move with this vaccination program. Thank you. Um, just to clarify, um, Jason, you were right. The website is on those that are vaccinated on BIPOC. What I was talking about, because I have access to more information, is that 55% uh, of BIPOC Verm uh, Vermonters have either been vaccinated or have made an appointment. And uh, I'll make sure that I follow up with Peter if he isn't listening uh, with this. Okay. Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. I heard you say that as we move through the phases of the Vermont Forward Plan, that towns and businesses can enact stricter guidelines in terms of masking and social distancing. And I believe you said in response to an earlier question that businesses can require proof of vaccination we had a question from a reader about what happens once the state of emergency is lifted. Can businesses and organizations continue to require masks? You know, I, I believe so, uh, Lisa, but I don't, um, from a legal standpoint, I probably should check. Um, but uh, from, my, from my perspective, they could, um, but we will not be in control of that. So who would be in control of that? I think it would be the business owners themselves. I mean, so we're, see, we're, see, we're seeing this, you know, we're seeing this play out uh, with some of the colleges and universities. I mean, many of them, hundreds of them have made, already made the decision that they're going to require uh, anyone coming back to school or, or enrolling in their uh, college or university um, have to have the, the vaccine in order to uh, to come um, to that institution. So I think we're seeing that already. 
but this is about masking whether masking can whether businesses and organizations can require masking yeah i again i think they can but we'll uh, let me let me i guess contemplate that and uh and check with our our council on that i i just don't know from a legal standpoint I okay, think it, I mean I mean think about Thank it very much yeah Lisa th think about it in terms of um, you know no no shirt uh, no right. shoes no service type of thing I, I think it's the same falls in the same category as that okay I look forward to the answer thank you very much <clears throat> Mike Donahue the Islander thanks very much uh, Jason uh, Secretary Smith, uh, welcome back. You are missed. I'm, I'm glad the governor finally gave you a few days off uh, after a year. <laughs> I don't know if this goes. I don't he, know if this He didn't ask you, me, but, Mike, uh, by the way. He just left. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm not sure who this goes to, but it deals uh, with farmers' markets. Uh, we're hearing about frustration with regulations for farmers markets uh, obviously many of the markets are going to be opening for the summer and one reader uh, said apparently <laughs> they were at a craft show uh, a big one at the university mall and customers were allowed to handle all the items and everything yet the farmers markets have been told you know they got to tape off their boots customers are not expected to touch anything why are the different rules between craft fairs and farmers markets for the state I'm going to let uh, Commissioner Sherling answer that, but again, he can clarify. Or, but but I think it's the organizations that make those decisions. It's not it's part of our guidance, Mr. Sherling. Good afternoon. Uh, you're right, Governor. I think some of that relates to uh, regulations that individual operators have decided to put in place. Uh, I would remind folks that uh, what we uh, announced earlier and have uh, reiterated today is tomorrow uh, we go to the phase two of the Vermont Forward Plan. So all retail operations, farmers markets, arts and craft shows all have uh, the same guidance at that point, which is the universal guidance that I outlined uh, earlier. Okay, and Governor, uh, I may have missed it, but, and I think you told Stuart uh, that uh, private businesses can legally ask employees if they've had their COVID-19 uh, vaccine shots, which seems like it's private medical information. Uh, I'm wondering, is the state government mandating state employees uh, turnover their medical records, uh, proof of uh, vaccinations, or they have to answer it. Uh, is and is this a possible HIPAA violation yeah. for the state or or the private employees? I mean, that I know the state when they give out the statistics, they fudge them a little bit and say, well, we can't say 100% anymore in the age groups because that would tell everybody that everybody's getting the the vaccine so now it leveled it off at 95 percent so how do you how do you resolve this apparent inconsistency yeah for, first of all i don't i don't believe if i did i didn't mean to say this uh, that there was any requirement of employees to have the vaccine in fact we can't um, it's under the emergency order so you, you can't force anyone to have it i think i was i was talking about customers uh, coming into uh, their place of business and whether they'd have to be masked or um, or identifying whether they had the vaccine or not so they knew whether they could go over their unvaccinated limit. Uh, think about an outside organization having some sort of a, a fair or something and uh, so they could go over that 300 person limit. So that's what I was talking about there. Um, but, uh, but I might, I don't know if Secretary Young is on uh, but we're not we're not requiring when uh, we're not requiring state employees to have uh, the vaccine uh, if and when they come back. Thank you, Governor. Um, that's correct. We're, we're not requiring it, uh, and we're currently um, developing a um, 
to plan for when the state of emergency is lifted and transitioning um, into the fall to uh, some sort of a hybrid return to work program. And that, you know, obviously there will be questions around that as we um, roll that out, but also, uh, you know, we're going to have more answers about the efficacy of the vaccine and, and uh, um, who's at risk if they're not vaccinated in the workplace. And, and you had talked about, you know, universities and colleges mandating all students. I mean, how do they get around mandating that if some of that information about whether somebody had their shots is private <laughs> medical information? I Again. mean, UVM or, or Champlain, you know, more, more of a, mandate yeah. it, More of a legal question, um, but, uh, but at the same time, I think that they mandate other vaccinations uh, as well. I mean, think about some of the summer camps and so forth where you had to have a vaccination or you're traveling or whatever it is. I think there is a provision somehow uh, to get there, but um, but maybe Secretary Young or somebody else can answer this better than I can. Governor, uh, this is Commissioner Harrington. I, I would just add that our legal team from a labor perspective is reviewing uh, the federal requirements about whether or not employ whether or not vaccination can be a condition of employment um, and we do expect to be able to issue some guidance um, coming out uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks as you know it's been a moving target uh, during the pandemic about specific requirements um, obviously not something that was contemplated prior to the pandemic uh, and the rules um, you know tend to tend to fluctuate or change. Um, so I would just, if I could, um, and if you're okay with it, circle up with our legal team um, and see if we have any uh, current additional guidance with regards to um, in requirements for employees and conditions of work. I'd also add, uh, yeah, that would be great, uh, Commissioner Harrington, but uh, Mike, you know, I know there's some healthcare providers, um, some organizations that require their employees to, for to have a flu shot or if they don't have a flu shot they have to wear a mask so it may fall in the same same guidelines as that and that was pre-pandemic okay yeah we've, we've gotten a couple of inquiries from readers that are just concerned that their medical privacy is being violated uh, by this but thank, thank you very much and uh, I'll wait to hear from all the legal people from the state to uh, when they hear from the feds. Okay. Thank you. Devin Bates, local 22, local 44. Uh, yeah, question for Governor Scott, and then if uh, Secretary French might be able to weigh in as well on this. We got an email from the mother of a UVM graduate from the class of 2020. Um, she was wondering why they're, you know, they're including apparently winter and summer 2020 in the graduation ceremonies this year but nothing for spring 2020. Um, I guess my question is um, you know when the new guidance was released for graduation it was said that these celebrations are um, not only possible but encouraged. Um, should schools be trying to do everything they can to fit in something for the class of 2020? Obviously it's been a tough year for them entering the workforce. There's logistical challenges to that but what are your thoughts on um, schools not you know doing something for that graduating class yeah i mean i think our guidance was about moving forward what what our expectations or our guidance or our advice is uh, for this year's uh, graduation what they do in the past is a part of whatever the organization whatever the school or university or college uh, deems appropriate so again this is all happening fairly quick i mean we um, we're only about four months into having vaccines, five months, and uh, we're getting to a point where we have over 60% of, of uh, those who are eligible uh, being vaccinated, which is uh, tremendous uh, in some respects when you think about where we were a year ago. So uh, times are changing. Um, our advice has been uh, that uh, you can, and uh, if, you, if you're willing uh, to have uh, a somewhat normal um, graduation, but to go backwards, I, I think that's up to the uh, individual districts as well as the uh, individual institutions. Secretary French, anything you want to add to that? No, I just uh, 
appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to the issue and uh, just to clarify that our guidance uh, pertains to K-12 schools, not to the universities. Um, but we are, you know, typically with guidance like this, as the governor mentioned, it just recently came out. Uh, typically what we do now is we answer questions from districts on very specific issues and then we compile those into frequently asked questions. Uh, we're seeing some, you know, probably six to ten questions on graduation so far, so we probably will produce a FAQ document on it. Uh, but so far, I think districts are finding uh, it fairly easy to work within uh, the framework that we've established between the guidance and the um, Vermont Forward Plan. But to the point about retroactively uh, going back, yes, that would be a consideration for the districts. But um, we haven't seen a lot of uh, discussion of that yet. But it could be out there, but I haven't seen it. All right, that's all I had. Thank you. Aaron Tanko, Vermont Digger. Um, Governor Scott, do you support expanding Dr. Dinosaur to pregnant women and children who are undocumented immigrants, which is being proposed in a bill that's passing the Senate today? Yeah, I think we propose something of that uh, same nature, um, but I'll have to look back. But, um, but generally, I, I think it's a small amount of money, uh, and I believe that it would be helpful uh, to those and to um, some of our undocumented refugee population and so forth. So I would encourage it. All right, thank you. Um, I also have a question about the, um, the graphic shared uh, on vaccination progress by age band. Um, you know, when you look at the number of people who have had been vaccinated or been scheduled, 18, 29 year olds or low, um, but it seems like the, the they're outstripping um, 16 and 17 year olds in the vaccinations that just haven't been signing up for their for the appointments. Do you think that they're just holding out for a walk-in clinic potentially, or or like the people being doing walk-ins like aren't being captured in the data? I think part of that uh, could be, and and this is just a. Uh, just my my gut is telling me that. Um, you can't have the you can't have the Johnson Johnson vaccine for those 16 and 17 when where you can in the 18 to 29 year olds so they they can have a one and done uh, type of uh, vaccination process so that's not available uh, to the 16 and 17 year olds so they have to go through that two dose process so that might be that may be why uh, but uh, I might ask Dr. Levine uh, to weigh in on that. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm sure that's a big chunk of it. Also, there was a time delay between the two groups, so there may be more in the 16 and 17 year old that are awaiting that appointment because they couldn't sign up as early as the 18 to 29 year olds. And then there is that opportunity still for the 18 to 29 year olds to be able to sign up for more clinics that have Johnson & Johnson when we get the good news that there's more and more Johnson & Johnson coming in. So I think there's a number of reasons. Okay, and when it comes to the, um, you know, the age group of like 50 to 65, maybe even 40 to 65, you know, the, the appointments have been open for them for a month or more now. Um, do you still anticipate yeah. um, those numbers increasing beyond this, um, you know, in, in 50 year olds, it's 72 percent. 60 year olds, it's 81 percent. Um, you know, I know that this population is a disproportionate number of hospitalizations in Vermont. Um, so it seems like it would be good to get them to a higher level. No, absolutely. Although they are a small percentage of the hospitalizations, but still, we're showing you one static graph in time, which is right now. But we follow this graph literally three times a week. And we have seen growth in each of those numbers you just mentioned over time. So they are continuing to increase as opposed to having plateaued. So that's the important take home message is uh, each of those age groups you mentioned continues to show increases on a week to week basis. Okay, thank you. Hey, I would love this to be included in one of the weekly uh, data updates, by the way. <laughs> I want to know these numbers. You can fill out an application. Um, there will be 
a hiring process and then you'd be involved. Uh, all right, maybe, maybe we'll talk about it then. <laughs> Greg Lamro, the county courier. I want to just clarify uh, some of the guidance that was that you've talked about earlier. So, high school sports, for instance, if spectators are in the outfield, social distanced, your new guidance would be that they wouldn't have to be masked. That is my yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I've spoken with some employers in the last handful of days who are wondering about the new unemployment policy for. Um, requiring people to, to apply for work. Um, some of these employers, uh, many of them have contributed to the UI trust fund for years. Uh, they're concerned that money from this fund is now going to be used to uh, pay workers who are unable medically to go back to work. And uh, their premise to the concern is that um, uh, many of these people, uh, or, or at least some of the employers believe that uh, the state has other ways of supporting people, whether it be a, a welfare system or, or something of the like, um, for people that can't work, rather than paying them through the UI fund. Uh, and, and of course, uh, from what I've heard, uh, a lot of those other funds uh, are backed by federal dollars. So I'm, I guess I'm wondering if you can kind of explain the rationale of keeping people on the UI system if they medically are unable to return to work. Um, because it's COVID related. Um, I think this uh, crisis has um, highlighted the fact that uh, through no fault of their own, they have been impacted. So. We, uh, it's not just our decision, I believe it's on the federal uh, side as well as uh, the legislature weighing in, but um, we just think it's the right thing to do because of the crisis situation we're in. Under normal circumstances, uh, you would not uh, be able to draw unemployment uh, due to a health condition. Uh, and I'm going to let uh, Commissioner Harrington uh, try and fix anything I've said that might not be correct, but. I believe that's the case. Uh, you are correct, uh, Governor. Um, it, specifically, though, to the question, I would say, you know, what we're looking at is temporary displacement from work for COVID-related circumstances. Obviously, as more people get vaccinated, those circumstances may um, become irrelevant. Um, certainly, situations like um, child care being suspended or a, a child going through remote learning, um, causing someone to be home. Um, but they really have to be uh, cases of um, COVID specificity. So for instance, there is um, a question right now before the U.S. Department of Labor about um, individuals suffering from long haul COVID conditions. And technically under our program, you know, someone who developed a health related condition because of they had contracted COVID at some point, but they no longer have COVID, they technically are not able and available to return to work because of a medical circumstance. And therefore they, like you said, would be eligible under some other, um, you know, longer term disability uh, benefit that's out there. So we really are talking about individuals that are um, quarantining uh, for a two-week period or until they um, resolve their, their COVID circumstance or if because of exposure, um, if their child is out of school, uh, if, if their child care has gone away, but it has to be a direct result of COVID, if they're caring for a loved one who is recovering from COVID, or they themselves have a condition um, that puts them in a high-risk category, but again, I think some of that is subjective because if they become vaccinated, does that risk go away? In which case they no longer are considered a, a high risk and can return to work. That would depend on the healthcare provider in that sense. Um, but again, what we're really talking about are COVID qualifying circumstances that are, 
are supposed to be short-term in nature. Uh, longer-term uh, or long-term disabilities or health conditions would fall under another, uh, another type of benefit. Is there any sort of discussion uh, about requiring people that, that fall into that category to, to get vaccinated in order to continue getting their benefits? I think that falls again, um, and someone else can correct me if I'm wrong, but again, we can't require anyone uh, to ha be vaccinated uh, under the emergency order. So um, I don't think that that would, uh, that would uh, survive uh, from a legal standpoint. Um, we're hopeful again, that uh, as we get back to normal, the more people that do get vaccinated and the more businesses that are open back up, the more tourism we start to see, and things getting back to normal that uh, people will be able to get back to normal employment. So I'm, I'm extremely, extremely hopeful um, by the 4th of July that uh, a number of people will not need the unemployment assistance and they'll be back to regular employment. I would also, I would also add, Governor, you know, for someone who um, has, is out of work for an extended period of time because they are, fall into a high risk category, and their healthcare provider has instructed them to quarantine, um, it's likely they've already gone through their initial 26 weeks of unemployment benefits. So any benefits they're collecting beyond that point are currently federally funded. Um, so they would be on the, uh, the extension program, the PEUC program um, through, you know, if they continue through the end of that program, which is September 4th, um, it would be federally, uh, considered federal benefits. Avery Powell, WCAX. With restaurants moving to universal guidance tomorrow, does that mean there won't be any uh, restrictions on hours of operations? And can municipalities still put those type of restrictions into place? The, the restriction on hours uh, continues. Uh, this is more about the, the guidance in terms of those in the restaurant uh, during those uh, business hours. And right now, that's, that's 10 p.m. closing, correct? That's correct. For bars and restaurants, it's 10 p.m. And do you have any idea when those will be lifted? I guess was just on July 4th, presumably? I, you know, sometime between now and then. Again, uh, everything that we're doing, uh, all these steps that we're taking along the way are based on vaccination rates. Uh, the better we do, uh, the better we do as Vermonters uh, in order to get uh, the increased number of people vaccinated, the quicker we can move to the next step. So uh, the 4th of July is our goal, um, but if we were able to get uh, to a point where we had uh, more uh, vac uh, vaccinations uh, completed, uh, it could be sooner than that. Finally, just what's the rationale for keeping those, those certain restrictions in place? Well, again, uh, you know, we are mitigating this. Uh, we're slowly, methodically moving away from some of uh, the restrictions we had in place. Uh, we think this next step makes a lot of sense. And then we'll contemplate whether we go uh, to uh, the next move, which would be to remove the restrictions on the hours. But we're just not there yet. Thank you. J.D. Green aired out. Thank you, Governor. Uh, first off, Governor, uh, so much thanks to your administration and to you for the outstanding job you have done in protecting Vermont. We have learned so much from these press conferences, and we appreciate everything you've invested in Vermont. Uh, Governor, my dad is a resident at a local nursing home here in Barrie. In just the last two weeks, there have been two positive cases from staff members resulting in a facility-wide quarantine. Skilled nursing staff were some of the first that were offered the vaccine when it first became available and granted uh, many, if not most, became vaccinated. Uh, still, there are some who are not, and you were speaking earlier about this uh, 18 to 29 uh, age group demographic, which is uh, which is right there. Uh, I recognize that 
this vaccine is not exactly 100 percent of effective and i recognize that we have the right to refuse this vaccine personal choice is uh, a fantastic privilege that we have i also recognize that vermont is an at-will state and that you've granted much flexibility for skilled nursing facilities to exercise their discretion to operate in ways that they feel is safest. My question for you, Governor, have you considered mandating all medical and skilled nursing staff to be vaccinated, especially skilled nursing facilities who are in very close contact with our immune compromised elderly here in Vermont, our most vulnerable? even when the fact that so many of these residents have long been fully vaccinated. Again, this, this is not 100% effective. My concerns are obviously great and quite personal for me. If the vaccination is not and will not be made mandatory for skilled nursing staff, I'm wondering why and what your personal feelings are about this going forward. Yeah, uh, J.D., this is an area of concern uh, for all of us. I mean, from the very beginning, we saw that the uh, long-term care facilities were, uh, that was their vulnerable population. Uh, that's where we've seen uh, a lot of cases, a lot of death. Uh, and so that's why we wanted to get uh, the vaccine in the arms of, of the staff as quick as possible. Um, it is frustrating uh, for me personally when I see uh, we have a high compliance in many, many of the long-term care facilities, and they're doing the right thing. Um, but there are some um, who aren't doing uh, that well, and uh, and they're they're impacting others, and again, that vulnerable population. Um, so, uh, having said all that, uh, I do believe these are um, private institutions. I think the uh, entities themselves, at some point, will have to contemplate whether they can. can uh, make it uh, uh, make it mandatory, but at this point in time, under the emergency uh, authorization, I don't believe they can uh, make it mandatory. But I know Dr. Levine has gone, uh, in particular, to the uh, veterans' home in Bennington, who, where they have a, a low uh, percentage of the the staff members um, vaccinated, or not as high as we want. Um, and he has uh, reached out uh, to try and find why or why is that and uh, and again trying to uh, provide the education necessary for them to make the right decision uh, but I might ask Dr. Levine to comment on this thanks governor and I, I just had some very recent experience that um, I can offer up here um, we talked earlier in the press conference about you know individual responsibility but also about peer-to-peer uh, -peer and connecting with people and allowing them to find the right reason for themselves. We've also talked about misinformation out there. All of those have played a role, in my experience, in the uh, case of people who work at long-term care who have chosen not to get vaccinated. But I raise them not to blame uh, anyone because there were all barriers that in individual cases we could overcome. So there was some uptick in vaccine after a, a sort of a town hall session uh, designed to let people voice their concerns. There um, was actually evidence that before we even interacted with those staff, a couple of them had interacted with each other and sort of called out the disinformation and corrected it and influenced behavior. So again, it becomes a very individualized thing, but it can be very, very effective. Um, and I would make sure that uh, the management and the administrative staff at those facilities, you know, avail themselves of opportunities to interact with people um, often letting them in interact anonymously so they don't uh, feel that they're being put under a spotlight, but just allowing those conversations to occur because that's really critical. Having the conversation, being able to point out where information is true, where information is false, and having the opportunity to find out what would really influence that individual in terms of their personal choice 
and make vaccination the right choice for them. So uh, don't give up on the facility that uh, your loved one is at uh, and work with their staff to, uh, their management staff to uh, create opportunities for the staff who may be more reluctant or hesitant to get vaccine to um, um, move along in their thought process. Okay, so this, uh, just ask again here, so this, this isn't anything that you would consider mandating? No, it's not something that uh, we're mandating at this point in time, and as the governor pointed out, um, the vaccines are still in the process of gaining full approval, um, and I think everyone would be much more comfortable when they get full approval, both in terms of even thinking about these things like mandating, but probably as importantly to those who are going to receive them, that that is an additional step in the right direction to reinforcing the effic efficacy and safety of the vaccines. Which, by the way, more and more reports are coming out with large-scale populations showing that you don't just need to be involved in a clinical trial to show that vaccine works and is safe. We're now seeing it real time in all the populations that have been vaccinated and there are now peer-reviewed publications from CDC and others that verify that these are effective in real-world use, not just in a study uh, setting. Thank you so much. Colin Flanders, seven days. Hi, I have a question for Commissioner Harrington. Um, the Labor Department said earlier this week that its legal team was reviewing the closure of the Coffee Cup Bakery to see if the company had complied with the WARN Act requirements. I'm just curious as to whether they've reached any conclusions yet. Uh, appreciate the question. Um, to my knowledge, no. Uh, so the way the process works and the reason we're connecting with them is that, um, you know, under, under the current statute, uh, if an employer is um, you know making a good faith effort to try to salvage a company and where um, divulging that information or the possibility of a closure um, might result might might end up um, causing undue harm to the employee the employer or uh, its negotiations with a financing company um, then they aren't met, they could be um, exempt from the provision. Uh, so what we are in the process of doing now is providing them formal notice that they did not comply with the timeline uh, and to let them know that they, um, you know, are compelled to provide us additional information uh, to see whether or not uh, they would meet that exemption. Um, but it really depends on uh, what occurred in the days and weeks uh, and months leading up to the notice, um, and it will be uh, up to them to show us that they have been making a good faith effort. Gotcha. And then just a quick follow-up. I, I vaguely recall something about the state suspending some of the WARN requirements when the pandemic first hit. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how that factors in and, and maybe confirm that I'm right there? Um, but is, is there anything that's been suspended that they might be able to point to and say we weren't required to do this? Um, not to my knowledge. I think administratively we had said, you know, especially with temporary layoffs um, where an employer was closed due to a government order, um, the, the Warren Act wouldn't necessarily apply. Um, obviously, that's not necessarily the case. Um, in this case, the closure was not based on any type of government order or any specific condition um, by the government. Um, so it really had to be uh, COVID specific early on during the pandemic um, for us to, to consider waiving that. Uh, and, and in the recent, you know, other layoffs that have occurred on COVID related, we have, we have also um, uh, ensured that there's compliance with the WARN requirement. Thanks so much. Thank you. Scooter McMillan, Shelburne News. Scooter, the Hi, sorry about the delay. Oh, sorry about the delay. Uh, 
the fire chief in Heinsberg has been embroiled in a controversy over a meme he shared on his personal social media account that many in town, including the fire chief himself, say was homophobic. And uh, we've discovered that this meme was not an isolated post, but part of a pattern of social media posts that many consider sexist, racist, or homophobic in a time when uh, people all across the board are feeling insecure. Uh, we have heard from uh, marginalized segments of the community who say they feel like they're uh, hated and worry uh, what the response would be if they, their family needed emergency services, if the response would be as diligent as it would be in light of these posts. Uh, what is your reaction to this issue that's affecting a Vermont community? Yeah, um, Scooter, this is the first I've heard of that situation. Obviously, don't condone that action. I would uh, offer uh, to anyone in, in public service to stay off social media, first of all. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I would, I would ask uh, that we treat everyone, especially in the position uh, that you're in, uh, to treat everyone with respect and dignity and, and uh, to be fair and, and just in, in everything you promote and everything that you do and everything you practice. So would you, what sort of policy do you think uh, would be justified? And what is the line between First Amendment rights and uh, social media use that makes some people feel marginalized or threatened yeah, uh, I, I, by public officials and employees? Yeah, I don't know. Um, first of all, I don't know. Uh, there should be like some sort of a code of ethics of some sort, I would think. Um, but uh, but I think that that's for the uh, local municipality to adopt. All right. Andrew McGregor, the Caledonian Record. Andrew McGregor, the Caledonian Record. To you, Governor, and your team for hanging in there. Um, circling back to unemployment, and this is probably for Commissioner Harrington, uh, our newspaper here has had two full-time employees received notification that the unemployment claim was made in their name, uh, both instances of fraud, including one about a week ago in which the employee visited the website to report it was false. The newspaper disputed the claim. Um, yet a full benefit check was issued and, in fact, received before even the dispute deadline. Um, first off, out of curiosity, how do scammers profit if these checks get sent to an employee's physical address? Uh, and more importantly, how prevalent are these false claims? Um, how often are the steps to ferret out the false claims not working uh, as in our instance? And how many employers have false negative ratings as a result? Uh, so a lot of questions there and a lot of different information. Um, what I would, uh, let me try to take those one by one, but essentially what likely happened is between the time uh, the claim, uh, the fraud report was submitted. Um, it probably had already gone through um, some form of processing step uh, and, uh, and a payment had been issued. Um, and, you know, when our team received uh, the fraudulent uh, report and, and went to put a stop on it, it may have just one occurred faster than the other. Um, the way our system is designed um, uh, currently, I shouldn't say currently, the way our system was modified during COVID was around expediting claims to ensure that um, people weren't waiting longer than need be um, for benefits to pay out. And so we were, individuals were able to come in the door, we would process their initial claim overnight, and the next day they could potentially file for benefits with payment going out the following day. Um, <clears throat> that's not always the case, but that is um, probably the, the fastest opportunity for that to happen. We have since put in um, multiple cross-match and cross-checks um, that are slowing that, um, that processing of payment just so we can conduct some additional checks, but, uh, checks on the information so we're not paying out fraudulent claims. Um, I will... Uh, I, 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 
would use this opportunity to just highlight we just highlight we saw a significant saw spike in claims uh, being filed just even earlier this week and over the past week um, that we found a high percentage to be fraud. Uh, and so, um, you know, the number of fraud reports that have uh, been submitted has gone up uh, over the recent weeks. If individuals do receive notice at their house, um, if they uh, saying they filed a claim and they didn't, um, they should report that to the department immediately. Um, I will use this opportunity just because it is part of the conversation to say um, the biggest uh, uh, avenue for fraud coming into the system was our online initial claims application. Um, and so uh, we have temporarily removed that um, from the web and individuals uh, needing to open an initial claim uh, need to call our call center first to validate their identity. Um, individuals uh, making their weekly claims can still do that online, but new individuals like coming into the system uh, need to file uh, by calling our call center. Um, to your question about your question. how fraud gets to individuals, mostly what we see are individuals, fraudsters, using direct deposit, and they may go in and file using a correct address, and then they may go in and change that information when they file to redirect it to a direct deposit, um, So, in, or they may use a, a different address to send the benefit check. So in this case, uh, I mean, it may have just been that the fraudulent filer um, hadn't made the changes to the account yet um, and the first check process before they were expecting it to and, and that's how it got to the individual at home but we know fraudsters are using you know individuals names social security numbers home addresses uh, phone numbers license numbers any data point that they think we're going to cross check against they will they will use that in the system so that it looks like the the actual individual filing the claim and so um, that becomes that makes it even increasingly harder for us to identify those that are fraud um, but when individuals do file a fraud report we do uh, put a, a cancellation on the claim um, and we do ensure that uh, the individual the, the vermonter in this case who's impacted by the stolen identity um, is not held liable for benefit payments um, that may have gone out the door uh, so again, individuals should report the fraud immediately. That ensures we can we can close out the account. We don't issue any fraudulent payments, and, and that they aren't held liable for those payments uh, later payment, on. Uh, later on. What's that, Andrew? What's that, Andrew? All right. Thank you all very much for tuning in today. We'll see you on Tuesday. Um, if you haven't uh, signed up for a vaccination, um, please do so this weekend. Take the time. It's for the public good, uh, and uh, it'll do a lot to get us to where we want to get back to normal. So thanks again.